There we go. All right, so we're diving into the book of Jeremiah. Um, we're going to talk about how some things just don't belong together. You know, uh, you see the sign off to the side here, uh, the Taco Bell fitness course, right? That just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you might think of things like oil and water. They just don't go together. They separate right away. Or toothpaste and orange juice is easily the most disgusting thing that you will ever encounter. Snow in Houston, they just don't go together. Mr. Patrick and running, uh, he is self-proclaimed. He would rather uh, rather let the bear catch him than have to run away from it. That's his own his own doing there. So sure. some things sure. just go to get, don't go together. But there are other things that look like they don't go together but are actually really, really good together. Uh, in this case, you've got things like French fries and Frosties. This has to be from Wendy's. I've got to say, it's not the same if it's from another like chocolate milkshake place or whatever. No, it has to be a French fry and a chocolate Frosty from, uh, from Wendy's. Pineapple and pizza. I'm a fan. If you're not, it's okay. Keep your hating to yourself. Pineapples and pizza are delicious. And a personal favorite, which I have a little backstory here for you, Doritos and pudding cups. Now here's the ding. When I was in elementary school, every day at lunch, uh, whenever I got Doritos, because we get like those, you know, big boxes of the mixed little uh, snack bags of chips. And so some days you got Doritos and then one day you got sun chips and that was like the sad day. Uh, and so whenever I got Doritos and pudding cups, I would dip my Doritos in my vanilla pudding cups, not the chocolate, just the vanilla. And I have not had this since like fourth grade, but I just so happened to have a bag of Doritos and a vanilla pudding cup. So we're going to try this live on air and see if it holds up. I'm pretty confident it does. Mr. Patrick doesn't believe me that this is gonna be delicious, but it's gonna be great. Oh, see, you got some of the cheese residue in the vanilla pudding. Mm -hmm. Totally holds up. If you're looking for a new delicious snack treat that you don't think is gonna to go together, but it does, it's delicious. It gives you that crunch, the sweetness, and the saltiness. Oh, so good all around. Some things don't look like they should go together, right? You look at Doritos and pudding cups and you're like, there's no way that you should be eating those two things together. And yet when you put them together, they are delicious. So sometimes we look all around us and we, we are told, the world tells us, those things don't go together. You probably have things like this in your own life that are more serious than Doritos and pudding cups, right? Uh, maybe you uh, like, uh, like to play football and you wanna be in the band, or maybe you uh, want to be involved in theater and you really like science classes. Uh, or, you know, there are these things that the world looks at it and says, those two, those two things do not go together, but you love these two things. And you know that when you're a part of those two things, they actually make each other better. They're really great. And you get to experience even more because you know those two things. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is what it's like to live in this space that we call tension, the space in the middle of these two things that don't seem to go together. What's it like for me to like Doritos dipped in my pudding cups? Even though Mr. Patrick tells me that's horrible and those two things should be kept apart and you should never put them together, I say, no, they can be held together because there's this tension and I like to live in the midst of that tension. When we're talking about the book of Jeremiah, that's the prophet that we're gonna be talking about tonight, right? You might remember last week, Patrick talked to us about uh, the prophet Isaiah. Well, this week we're talking about the next prophet, the prophet Jeremiah. And when we're talking about the prophet Jeremiah, he's holding two ideas in tension as well. He's holding these ideas of judgment and hope, judgment and hope. These are the two ideas that he is holding in tension with one another. And we often look at something like judging something and being hopeful for something. And we think those two things can't go together. Those two things are different ideas. They're not something that you can put in the same place. But Jeremiah over and over is gonna show us how we can hold judgment and hope right next to one another. We can hold those two things in the midst of that tension. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on that green space right there in the middle, that tension between the Doritos and the pudding cup. All right. So let's get into a little background. First, when was Jeremiah writing? Um, mostly he was writing in the decades that surround the fall of Judah. All right. Now we're going to go back to a slide that you saw a long time ago, uh, back in the fall, when we first started talking about the Old Testament. This was kind of our timeline of the Old Testament. So you remember the red line is where we were in all the Genesis stories. Um, the little shorter blue line is Exodus through Deut Deuteronomy. The green line is the time before there was a king. The orange line is all the time when there were kings, including a time when there was a civil war. And during that civil war, uh, the North and the South split off from one another. That happens in about 725 all right, so around 720, oh, sorry, that's 925. 925 is when that civil war happens and there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. 200 years later in 725, northern Israel falls to a foreign power and they're taken off and they're destroyed. And so the last little bit 
is the southern kingdom of Judah, um, where, where, where Jerusalem is, it's where the temple is, it's the heart of everything that is still the nation of Israel is now in this southern kingdom known as Judah. And that's where Jeremiah is prophesying. He's working in this area. I um, mean, he's working this area right around 587 or so, uh, right before uh, the southern kingdom is going to fall. And then he continues to prophesy after they're taken into exile in Babylon. Okay, so if we're looking at the timeline of the story, we've had Moses, we've had uh, Joshua, we've had Saul and David and Solomon, we've had lots of other kings who have come through, we've had a big war, and now we're just about to go into this major period of exile, this period where we're going to be living in a foreign land for a while um, before God is going to bring us back. We're still about 580 years before Jesus, all right? So that's when Jesus, or when Jeremiah is around and when he's doing his prophesying. Now, uh, who was Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah, unlike most of the other prophets, was actually a member of the priesthood. And so he was someone who was known in the temple of Jerusalem. He was uh, known to the priests. He was part of, their, part of their inner circle. And he looked around and saw all the things that the priests were doing, all the things the priests were allowing to happen outside of the city gates. And he was the one who said, this is all wrong. We should, this is not what we should be doing. This is not in line with what God wants for us or for God's uh, people. And so he was kind of bringing this message on his own class. He was kind of critiquing himself along with uh, those who were around him. And he was really uh, prophesying against his own position, which is a little bit unique for uh, the prophets that we're going to be uh, seeing throughout the Old Testament. What was his message? Well, his message is that God is about to bring judgment on Israel. And so God is going to use this foreign nation of Babylon, and they're going to come in and they're going to destroy Israel and take all of the people into exile. That's a part of his message. And the other part of the message is that God is going to restore Israel. This is the hope piece, that there's going to be this judgment where Babylon destroys Israel, but there's also hope for the day when Israel is going to be restored. And through that restoration of Israel is how we're going to restore all nations back to God. And so Israel is going to be restored, and through that process, all of the nations are going to be back into right relationship with God. Ultimately, we as Christians look back at this and say, this is pointing to Jesus, that that's how God is going to accomplish that. But for tonight, we just need to remember that that's Jer Jeremiah's message, that judgment is coming, but there's also hope for that day when all things are going to be restored. So let's take a look here really quick. We're going to dive into Jeremiah uh, chapter 18. This is one story from Jeremiah. There are lots of really great stories. 29 has a really famous passage uh, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. You might be familiar with that one. Lots of other very quotable pieces what? of Jeremiah. I'm somebody, on have a, oh. somebody have a question? Thank you. I'm on Echo it. Tool, do you have a question? Uh, no. I'm no. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. All right, so uh, Jeremiah uh, 18, one through four is where we're going to start. This is the a story of the potter's wheel, all right? So the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, come and go down to the potter's house. It's a potter who's making pottery, right? That kind of potter. And there I will let you hear my words. So I, meaning Jeremiah, went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel, like a potter's wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to him. So you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. I want you to answer this question. What does Jeremiah see in the potter's house? What did we just read? What did Jeremiah see when he went down to the potter's house? He unmute saw, yourself and let me know. Yeah, Logan. He saw the potter working on um, a vase, but yeah. then he messed up the vase and he tried, started over again. Yeah, he saw the potter working on some pot, right? Pot, vase, cup, bowl, something. I don't know, something out of clay. And it wasn't looking right. So he, the potter destroys it smushes it down and says, I'm going to start this over again. It's kind of like this. Um, this is a, a video from YouTube. So it's in like super high speed thing, but this is kind of what the pottery is like, right? And then they build it up, they build it up, build it up. And then they say, hmm, maybe that's not quite what I want. And they smush it down again. And then they, whoop, that's definitely not what I want. So they start over and they start building something else. And this can go on for a long time. This is, I have not ever thrown pottery like this. So if any of you have ever done this, um, you know that it's very, very difficult work, but it's very easy to fix mistakes because you just start over, right? And so if you make a mistake, you just kind of say, okay, I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'm going to rebuild this to make it the way that I want it to be. Uh, and so for the potter, destroying what they've made is not an act of vengeance and it is, it is an act of love. It's an act of, I don't want this to fail in this way. I can see that if I keep going this direction, my my clay pot, my vase, whatever I'm making isn't going to work. So I need to take this down so that I can rebuild it so that it will be strong enough to be 
um, the thing that I want it to be. And so it's not an act of just destruction, but it's actually an act of destruction out of love and a desire for the pot to be um, the best that it can be. So that's where the potter starts. That's what Jeremiah goes and sees. Now, God is going to continue speaking with Jeremiah here. So this picks up in the next verse, uh, 18, verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So, again, unmuting yourself as you so choose. What does this tell us about God's relationship with Israel? What does this first tell us about God's relationship with Israel? I'll back up here so you can read it again if you need to. I think it means that they have, like, a really good relationship and a relationship that they can always like start over and they'll still be the same kind of like pottery okay so they can always start over that's true but what has to happen uh i think that was jack o'toole jack what has to happen for them to be able to start over um i'm not really sure okay that's all right i'd say i'd say it's like because he's letting them get conquered by everybody yeah he's like, that's like how they're he's trying to start over yeah that god's essentially saying we, you, you have this has to be torn down this has to be destroyed in order that it can be uh, rebuilt again, just like the clay on the potter. Remember, the potter builds it up, says that's not right, smushes it down, starts over again. God says this has to be torn down. This has to be destroyed for this to be rebuilt up uh, in the way that it needs to be. So it's some really interesting imagery that we get about God's relationship with Israel and what God is trying to, to get at for. We're going to skip forward just a couple of verses um, to verse 11 of that same chapter. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Now, I want you to vote for me this time. You can use the thumbs up or the clapping symbol. Um, a thumbs up if you think this verse is about judgment and a clapping symbol if you think this verse is about hope. Thumbs up or clapping. I see some thumbs ups, one clapping, some more thumbs up coming in, some more clappings coming in. All right, some of you unsure or just unwilling to answer perhaps. Lots of options here, so let's take a look. What I think this is about, like I said at the beginning, I think it's about both. I think this verse is a verse of tension. This is a, this is a verse where we see both parts of the message playing out. Um, because the potter destroys that which doesn't look right with the promise of rebuilding it. That's always the potter's promise. The potter doesn't destroy it just to throw it off to the side and never use it again. The potter destroys the clay that doesn't look right with the intent of rebuilding it, with the intent of, of bringing that up to be, to be stronger and to be better for the future. That's always the intention that's there. This is the theme that's going to carry throughout Jeremiah. Um, and it's a theme that's carried in our story as well. Right? When we look all around us, and when we're asking this question, maybe what about us, right? There are lots of places in our world, in our own lives, even where there is going to be judgment, right? Or that we know there's, there's things that are not in line with what God wants for us. We know that that's in my own life that I'm doing things God doesn't want me to do. Or I know that in the world around me, things are happening that God doesn't want uh, to have happen. We know that that's true. We know there are going to be places in which judgment comes, but we also know that there is a hope. And we also know that we hold on to that hope in the midst of everything else that we face. We're going to talk a lot more about that in small group. Um, so I'm not going to dive too far into that because I want you all to have that question time for yourselves when we get there. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen.